Hi. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, uh, there's some network issue glitch out. So this, uh, I just start again. This uh, welcome Hello. everyone back again. Hi. Uh, yeah. To this nature in our cities webinar series brought to you by the Azim Print University. Uh, you know, typically whenever we speak of nature, we speak of flora and fauna, animals in the wild and everything. But there's a whole lot of nature that that uh, you know lives all across us, you know, right in our homes, in our cities, and even underneath our sofas. So you know, of late we have been throughout this series we have been talking about the different species and you know the kind of role they play in our lives. Uh, we of late we have gone very interesting. We have had, we have experts who have spoken to us about the hedgehogs, the birds, spiders, macaques, and in our last episode we even said hi to the frog. So if that frog made you sit up, today is the time to jump because as we say, oh my God, it's a cockroach. So we'll be dealing, you know, talking about issues related to the interplay of cockroaches and humans and what better expert to have on board than a cockroach scientist himself. So welcome on board, uh, Professor Naveed Ahmed Khan. Uh, yeah, so I'll just give a brief introduction for everyone out here. Professor Naveed Ahmed Khan, he has got a long history lots of awards and everything, a Google search on him will will reveal a trove of your own data on him. There will be so much thing that you will get lost. Uh, currently, he's a professor of medical uh, microbiology uh, at the University of Sharjah. He has worked in UK, US, Malaysia, uh, you know, everywhere that you, uh, you can talk of. And he has been researching uh, on cockroaches for over a decade now. So we are we are hoping that he'll have a lot of interesting insights to share with us. So you know, over to you, uh, Professor uh, Navid Khan. And just a small request to all our viewers: if you have any questions or queries that you would like to you know get answered by our cockroach scientists on board, please share them in the live chat box, and we'll take them at the end of the talk. Thank you so much. Welcome on board, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for a very kind introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, can I have my first slide, please? Yeah, I'll just click. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I take this uh, cockroach scientist as a compliment. <laughs> it doesn't sound that uh, interesting. But anyway, I hope that the work we are going to present will be interesting and fascinating. Idea is that we build capacity. That's more important to me that we bring our new generation close to the kind of work that we do because in my view research has to be something which can be understandable to the younger generation and to the older generation it's not just focused only for scientists it should be to the broad community and that's where i'm going to focus on so really the title i've given it generally uh, to war on terror cells because we are interested in infections and infections are a huge problem for our community and that's where we bring in the concept of different species. Uh, before I begin, I just want to highlight that, you know, Homo sapiens, we are just one species as human. They're just Homo sapiens. And uh, what we fail to understand is that uh, there are millions and millions of other species that are inhabiting this planet. And I don't um, understand that why do we feel that Homo sapiens or humans are the best species and they are the dominant species. Uh, there are many other species which are much more successful compared to us. They're much better species than we are. Uh, you know, we, we came to this planet when? Approximately fossil records suggest that we came to this planet about 50,000 years ago or maybe 100,000 years ago or whatever. But then there are other species like cockroaches who have been here for more than 350 million years ago. So they have seen everything. So all the events, all the extinction events and everything they have seen, and they have survived very well. They are among the, the very few species that can tolerate a nuclear attack and without uh, being eradicated. So we ought to learn, we ought to respect these species that are living on this planet with us and not be uh, affected by many of the problems that we get affected so easily. So, you know, when we think about uh, coronavirus or COVID-19, we have these masks and we have disinfectants and we have so many of these gadgets and measures that we are using to prevent these infections infecting us or our livelihoods. But at the same time, the very species like cockroaches or many other animals, and especially cockroaches, who are living in the same kind of environment that we are living in, 
they don't have to, they don't have access to the similar kind of measures, disinfectants or they live in pollution, unhygienic condition, and yet they thrive in those environments. Again, suggesting that we ought to learn from these species that what do they have in them? What really do they have in them? That's making them so powerful, so potent, so effective in evolving and adapting. We are not very good in evolving and adapting. They're excellent in evolution and in adapting to the environment. So we ought to learn from them. We have to find out the, what kind of stuff they have in them. We need to pull it out and we need to use uh, to our benefits. That's the key message I want to give for this talk. I'm not sure how to move on to the next, okay, next slide. Uh, so just to give you a quick background that um, this is an in interesting slide that there are so many infections which affect us as humans and uh, it does not matter that how many antibiotics you have and how many antibacterials you have and how many pharmacies you go to every single year more than 15 million people will die every year on this planet because of just top 10 infections so you know Respiratory infection will kill nearly 4 million people. HIV will kill nearly 3 million people and so on. And to me, the most puzzling and distressing aspect is that these numbers have remained significant. 15 million people have remained the same uh, despite the discoveries that we have made, despite all the research advances that we have made. Even today, more than 15 million people are dying. So this again suggests that we ought to learn from other species and we have to move away from this idea that killing one species for the benefit of another species. Maybe we need to learn about coexistence. Maybe that should be also something we need to consider as well in the future. And um, uh, again, what you see is that there is emergence of these superbugs, antimicrobial crisis. You know, you see this first generation antibiotic and second generation antibiotic and third generation of antibiotic suggesting that the same bugs which we are uh, able to kill or eradicate easily, we can no longer kill them easily because they are becoming very resistant because of the emergence of many of these medical procedures. And again, to highlight the importance of uh, we need to find new drugs, new antibiotics, new antimicrobial is shown in here, that over the years there have been very few new uh, antibiotics which have been discovered and what you see here in the from 2003 to 2007 only four new drugs were approved by the USA FDA Food and Drug Administration suggesting that the number of new antibiotics coming into the market are very few and these are not really truly new antibiotics or antimicrobial these are kind of a uh, the, the small changes, you know, one carbon from here and replace it with nitrogen or hydrogen and so on. So these are first generation, second generation. These are not truly novel molecule. And that's what we need to do. We need to find out novel molecule from, from the uh, new sources. Um, I don't know why I show this slide always, but I think probably the message is that uh, uh, zoonotic infection, they're also contributing to our misery. They're also contributing to, they're also affecting us as well. Like the, um, uh, the, the hypothesis is that the coronavirus had jumped from bats to human. So, you know, zoonotic infection are also contributing to the problem that we are facing as well. So we're not, we are, uh, uh, we, we are constantly uh, under threat because of the, emerging pathogens as well as the existing pathogens that we have at our disposal. This is my family and <laughs> I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but this is uh, Salahuddin, he's my older son and this is Muhammad, the um, younger son. This is Iman and this is Rafaya, my wife. So when we have these uh, kids, I was in Nottingham, I believe at the time. And uh, so a lot of our, um, uh, uh, our friends, they gave us these books. They said, you know, uh, Naveed, you really need to protect your kids. You really need to make sure they wash their hands properly and they use these antibacterial soaps and they use these uh, disinfectants. And you need to make sure if they use the washroom that the hands are clean, if they go on the food table, they, you know. So they gave us a lot of advice. And that's where we came up with the hypothesis that we are protecting Homo sapiens. We are protecting our species so that they don't get infected. They don't contract those kind of problems. Um, but what about other species that we see? You know, what about cockroaches? They thrive in those very unhygienic conditions that we cannot imagine. 
and um, and, and they're, they're happy with that. Uh, so that's where we came up with the hypothesis that they must have something in them. They must have some powerful molecules, powerful mechanism in them, which they can use to defend against those superbugs and viruses and bacteria and many other pathogens. And, and what we need to do is to research these animals, give them respect, and then pull out those mechanisms and molecules and those drugs and then use them for our benefit because we are running out of those antibiotics and antimicrobials. So that really is the key hypothesis that we, have, uh, we started using in our research. My apologies, there, there were some animations. That's why you don't see this um, uh, slides very well. But bottom line in here is that uh, I understand that cockroaches is one of the most hated insect on this planet. You know, when we see them uh, anywhere, we just step on them. And please don't bring them to my lab. <laughs> we'll make some use out of them. Uh, and they, they, they're one of the hardiest insect on this planet. They can survive without food for more than a month. That's a lot. They can survive without air for more than 45 minutes. They can be submerged underwater for more than 30 minutes without dying. They can tolerate very high level of radiation. The, the, the kind of radiation that can kill me, they can tolerate 15 times more of that radiation without being killed. They don't get, they don't contract cancer. They don't develop cancer. We do. So the kind so they have, uh, and they can, uh, and we know very well that when you use the insecticide, and I use it in my home as well for mosquitoes and so on, and uh, rarely you just see cockroaches run away. It's very hard to kill them. Uh, they may slow down, and but they, they can basically tolerate so many things that are very, very detrimental to our health and our existence. And as I mentioned, they have seen almost everything. They've been here for more than 350 million years. Again, suggesting we ought to learn from them that how do they evolve, how do they adapt, what do they have, which makes them such hardy insects and we can use them for our benefit. So yeah, there's a lot of debate about the, what's the next species that's going to uh, inherit this planet from us. You know, people say that when we are wiped out from this planet, who will be the species, the dominant species? So people say viruses will be the dominant species that will be the only remaining species on this planet. And then the next um, idea was the superbugs. They may be there. So my, my view is that, you know, cockroaches, they are also up there. They could be the, the, the species that in, can inherit this planet from us. So we, again, ought to learn from them and use their mechanism for our benefit. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the detail. But bottom line is that we started working on these kind of species, be that cockroaches and locusts, and try to find out that what do they have in them, and we need to use them for our benefit. And locusts is another species, another pest, just like cockroaches are considered as pests, and uh, it caused a lot of devastation, famine in many countries. So again, this is uh, also exist in countries which are affected by so many problems, so we ought to learn from them as well. So it's very easy to, to work with cockroaches. <laughs> Actually, it's much easier. So whenever I go to a university, I say, you know, um, uh, do you have animal facility? They always say, yes, we have animal facility. And do you have insectary to work with these kind of species? It's generally, the answer is no. We do not have a functional insectary. So I always ask this question. You know, we are in the UAE or, or in South Asia or in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. We have so many of these vector-borne problems. We ought to have insect trees. It should not be based on fashionable uh, terminology that we have the animal house, but it should also be need-based, the community-based, which is the research that we ought to be doing. So cockroaches are very easy. They can be reared. So what we do in our lab is that we just put them in a, in a bucket and we give them, they eat anything, basically. So very easy to culture, very, very easy to breed. Uh, and um, you, you can they generally eat any kind of material. We actually started giving them plastics and cardboards and any organic matter. They are happy with that. So the, no need to have any any fancy equipment or anything to, to, to breed them. So what we do is that we collect their blood. Uh, and for invertebrates or insects, the blood is known as hemolymph, which is in, uh, mentioned here. So basically it's yellowish material, uh, which is but I'll 
for simplicity, I'll call it blood of uh, of insects rather than hemolymph. So we collect their blood, we collect their fat body, we collect their different tissues. Because the idea is that if we're trying to find out that what do they have in them, which is giving them protection against viral infection, against bacterial infection, against pathogens, against microbial infection, fungal infection. So it must be in somewhere in the tissue, right? It could be in the blood, it could be in the fat body, it could be in the muscle. They have an open circulatory system, these invertebrates or insects, right? They don't have these tissues like we do. We have lungs and heart and liver and all those tissues. They don't have that. They have an open circulatory system, but they have blood, they have gut, they have muscle. So we collected their various tissues uh, from uh, locusts and from cockroaches, and then we we iso dissected out their uh, ganglia, the basically the brain part. So this is what you see here, the bilobed uh, uh, is the the brain of uh, of a locust, uh, and so we collected this uh, so we can you know dissect out. This is what the brain looks like of a locust, and similar way we have done anatomical dissection of cockroaches as well. So we collected their brain, their fat bodies, their muscles. And then we want to find out that what do they have in them, which is protecting them against the, um, these uh, pathogens. So at the time I was working at the University of Nottingham and um, the, the, uh, with the Ministry of Defense in the UK, and they were very interested in MRSA. MRSA is one of these superbugs, uh, a bacterial pathogen, which is a huge problem for the UK. So they were funding our research. And uh, so they were interested in that, how can we kill these superbugs? So what we did was that we took out these cockroach brain lysates uh, or locust brain. So we took the brains out, mashed them up basically, just to put it simply, and we put them with 1 million bacteria. So what you see here is a 10 to the power of six. So these are the MRSA, which are the superbugs. So we took 1 million of these bugs and put them together with the the brain lysates or mashup brain of cockroach or locust. And what you see here is in this plate, do you see large, large number of these bacteria which are present on the plate? And when you put brain lysates of cockroaches or locusts, uh, the bacteria are completely eradicated, completely de dead. So brain lysates of these insects can kill, show 100% kill rate against the superbugs that we that, that we tested again. So this was a very fascinating finding that these uh, lysates, these crude extracts, these kind of material, which are very potent in killing, showing 100% kill rate of, uh, of a superbug. So we were very, very enthusiastic about these findings. And again, my apologies, uh, this animation did not show up. Um, but um, uh, in here, the uh, uh, bottom line is that uh, so this work was picked up by by the uh, um, by the U.S. agencies, by the U.K. agency, New Scientist, the U.K.-based magazine. Then there was uh, Science News, the U.S.-based magazine, and BBC. They they came to the uh, uh, our lab as well to find out that how uh, how we're going to isolate these antibiotics from cockroaches, and then we can fight MRSA or these superbugs against them. So they were very very enthusiastic about this this research. And then many other uh, media out outlets, they were very interested in, in this kind of work. So our hope is that uh, eventually cockroaches uh, will find their, make their way into the affection of the human race. So, you know, when you see them uh, in the bathroom, you don't, your bathroom are probably very clean. When I see them in the bathroom, don't step on them. Just, um, you know, uh, bring them to us so we can make use of them. So they're very interesting species to look at. That's the take home message for you. So what we are, I just want to shift slightly so you're aware of other opportunities because the idea is that we promote this kind of research. So I just put a few extra slides. Um, I hope I will be allowed by the moderator, but uh, I just want to kind of showcase that what other things you can do because, uh, you know, there's so many interesting things. So uh, in here, I don't want to go into detail. What I want to show is simply that when we took cockroach brain, only five microgram, five microgram is a very small amount. Even five microgram is good enough to kill almost 90% uh, of superbugs that we, we threw at them. And just to uh, put into context, five microgram, um, normally when we use plants and garlic and other material, and if 10 milligram, if the activity or the kill rate is uh, uh, in 10 milligram, is considered as good. 
So these are showing five microgram of this brain lysates are showing very, very important activities suggesting that we ought to identify those molecules, which would be very useful for our... I don't want you to, to be uh, to worry about this slide. The only message in here I want to give is that naturally the question is that these new drugs that we are finding in the cockroach brain, are they toxic to human cells, to us or not? This is a natural logical question. So we tested that and I just want to show you. So this is what the human cells look like under the microscope and uh, uh, so basically the cockroach brain were not toxic to human cell but they were very toxic to the superbug to the bacteria so that's the take-home message and next question that we wanted to find out that how many molecules are there in a single cockroach brain so you know whether it's a one molecule whether it's 10 molecule whether it's you know more than that so we have identified so far more than 200 molecules so you can imagine the kind of opportunities that exist. So there are more than 200 molecules and, um, uh, and there, uh, there are probably more than um, uh, one drugs that we can pull out from this, uh, these cockroaches, which can, we can bring to a pharmacy near you. So this, this could be the, the first antibiotic from an insect which can come to a pharmacy that we strongly believe in. Uh, again, just to kind of give you a background information, most of the antibiotics that you see in the market in a pharmacy, they are derived from soil bacteria or yeast or fungi from the soil. So, uh, but not from the, from insects or other species. So we believe that this will be an interesting area of research that we ought to look at. So now going back to that, how we can test, um, uh, expand this hypothesis and bring other uh, younger minds as well to this kind of research that why limit this research just to cockroaches why not apply this knowledge to many other species that you see you know in the in the streets well, what do you see i mean you don't see a crocodile in the street but <laughs> you see crows right crows I, I see in pakistan there's so many crows there and crows are always eating junk and uh, pollution and organic material and all that right you see that and uh, so question is that how do they survive? Why don't they get infected? Uh, same question, snakes. You know, snakes eat uh, live rats, rodents. So a question, they don't get uh, infected. So we know rats are full of germs. We know they have so many of these pathogens and so on, but snakes, they don't get infected. Um, so, and same thing for cockroaches. Um, uh, and the same thing for crocodiles. Crocodiles, they eat rotten meat and they, they, they don't, uh, and they, they thrive, they can live up to 100 years. Uh, so again, you can apply similar kind of hypothesis to any species that you are interested in. So you may see a species uh, and, uh, near your home and you say, oh, you may come across that kind of work where you say, okay, this lives in pollution, in unhygienic condition. So how come they can do that? And we have to, you know, my mother makes me chicken curry and then she has to put so many spices and cook it to death. But these species can thrive on such unhygienic material and yet they can thrive on that. So we did a little bit of work. I don't want to go into detail because this is not a scientific seminar. I just want to give you kind of flavor of the type of research that we do in our lab. So we were interested in crocodile. Crocodile is one of the fascinating species. I really, I think it's one of the amazing species. For cockroaches, people can complain or, or highlight or be criticized. And you know, cockroaches, they have a limited lifespan. So that's why they are being produced in such large numbers that uh, they may, they may be many of them die, many of them don't die. But what about these species? These reptiles are very interesting species. So crocodile, they're very large animal. They can live up to 100 years and they eat rotten meat and they don't get, and when they fight with each other, they get these wounds and they heal automatically. You know, they heal by themselves without the application of antibiotics and so on. Again, suggesting that we need to pull out those molecules and we need to bring to a, to a pharmacy uh, so that we can use them. We don't have to rely only on soil bacteria and soil fungi. We have to look at other kinds of species as well. There are millions of them we need to look at. So most of the research so far has been focused on plants and, and so on. But these are interesting species that we need to look at. So uh, to, to, to work on crocodile, I wanted to test this hypothesis. And so I went to um, a farm, a crocodile farm in, in Malaysia. And um, so this is the kind of water they live in. So it's fully contaminated, full of heavy metal. We tested this 
and full of lead and all kinds of heavy metals in there. And it just begs the question that why don't these species get cancer? You know, we are exposed to lead and petrol, we get cancer. Uh, and uh, the crocodiles are always sunbathing. I go out in the sun in, in the UAE, I have to put all these sun creams to protect my skin, not to get cancer. But what about these species that they are, um, they, they're thriving, they're always sunbathing and they're always in heavy metals. They're always eating uh, rotten meat. This is a kind of meat. I, I, I apologize for uh, ruining your dinner, but I think it's important to really give you the message that this is a kind of meat which was being fed to crocodiles. So I complained to the manager. I said, why are you giving them such rotten meat? It's, it kind of smells so bad. So he, he told me that, you know, even if we give them clean meat, they will make it rot before they'll eat it. Uh, so it's the smell of uh, the rotten smell that they like. To them, that's the biryani and chicken curry and, and all that, right? So it, it's important to appreciate that that, um, that their uh, way of life is very different. So we ought to, to, uh, to learn from them. So we were very fortunate that uh, it took me two years to, um, uh, to, to get permission from the government uh, to, to obtain one crocodile for our research because we wanted to test this hypothesis that uh, they must have something in them which is protecting them. So we got one cro uh, crocodile which is adult male. This is our team. Uh, these are the brave people who then went and uh, we got this uh, male crocodile, adult one. It, it was 14 feet long. So we brought it to our lab in our uh, university. And uh, because it's a protected species for some of the countries, I'm not sure about India, I think probably it is a protected species there as well. So you have to have permission from the wildlife department to then. But in other, other countries like Malaysia, they actually pay you to, to, to kill crocodile because there are so many of them. So we brought one crocodile into the lab. It's 14 feet long and it's a very interesting uh, this is a uh, team crocodile Dundee. Some of you probably have seen that movie. So we <laughs> brought them into the lab and uh, did the dissection. And so this is a material uh, that we got. So, you know, you can imagine it's huge. Uh, so much body mass uh, from there. And I really wanted to have a bar barbecue party that day for the department. But uh, then my mother told me it's not halal, so we didn't. But anyway, <laughs> so again, testing the same hypothesis, we did the dissection, took out the tissue, and then we wanted to find out whether these tissue have what kind of molecule they're producing and what kind of material they have, which can be antibacterial, antimicrobial, antipathogenic that we can use for our... Uh, so we have shown that, so, but I don't want to go into detail. I've already shown the kind of assays that we do. So just to show you, give you a picture of the kind of species that we have so far worked on. So crocodile is one. Uh, python. Python is again a very interesting species. It, it can also feed on animals, organic waste and so on. Uh, water monitor lizard um, uh, is another interesting species. It's kind of a basically a very big lizard. Um, uh, is mostly in Indonesia and, and in Malaysia region. And uh, tortoise, uh, and another uh, interesting species to look at. Uh, so, for, uh, for, forgot to mention for crocodile, another interesting finding for some of you who are interested in that. Uh, so far, what we have found is that uh, crocodiles don't get cancer. We do. One of uh, one out of three people, uh, one out of three of us will get cancer in our lifetime. Crocodiles don't get cancer yet; they have a very long uh, lifespan, suggesting. We ought to learn from them, not just from anti-pathogenic point of view, but also from anti-cancer molecules as well from them, which can help us as well. So we ought to learn from these species. Yeah, so this is the, the, the crocodile. This is the team that was part of this crocodile study as well. And we have published this work. If some of you are interested in this, you feel free to, you can uh, email us. We will be happy to share our findings with you or you can um, you know, be part of our research as well. We're also building capacity. So we are all you know, younger minds. So we're also training them as well. And they're very brave. <laughs> These two kids, uh, and they you know, they also want to play with this crocodile and all that. Very interesting work. So going back to the, just uh, very quickly, last few slides. Um, uh, if I have time, I'll request the moderator. Yeah, is that okay? I have time. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So we were interested in uh, in snakes. Snake is another interesting species. They eat live rats, suggesting they must have something in them. 
and uh, we got black cobra because that's where uh, you know one of the common species we have in south asia right it's uh, it's common it's uh, deadly uh, and um, so you got this cobra from pakistan and uh, so there was this myth that cobra venom must be very powerful that's why it is not able to get infected or and so on so we took the venom out it had zero anti-pathogenic activity against any of the pathogens that we tested so again superbugs again bacteria against viruses against anything if anything venom actually um, promoted growth of these bacteria which was to us so, so that was interesting finding so venom is maybe very toxic to us but it has absolutely no effect on antimicrobial properties of of the uh, snake which suggests it must be something in the tissue or in the immune system of these animals so we did the usual research i don't want to go into detail uh, i want to leave some time for q a uh, so we did the usual dissection uh, and we collected its uh, various tissues uh, its blood we collected then its heart lungs liver uh, kidneys intestine gallbladder and, and many other tissues and then we did the same thing and we showed that uh, its blood was very potent against some of the bacteria it was very potent against mrsa which is a superbug it was very potent against pseudomonas streptococcus so overall suggesting that it has very good activity against some of the pathogens and so what we need to do now is to not look at the crude extract but actually look at the individual molecule which are showing such potent activity and then hopefully we can bring them to a pharmacy near you. So, so far our work is focused on the immune system. So as you know, immune system is antibodies and immune system is peptides and many other things, right? So then we, we thought that we ought to look at that maybe there are two kinds of defense mechanism in any species like us. We have two kinds of mechanism. One, we have our immune system, and I'm, I hope that you're familiar with the immune system, especially with COVID-19. You know that some people are responding better, some are not responding as much. So immune system is one mechanism which is uh, by us, by our cells, uh, which we produce to defend us. And second part is gut bacteria. You know, in, in the gut, we have these bacteria, which are known as good bacteria and bad bacteria. So one possibility can be that these cockroaches and these insects and these snakes and crocodiles, maybe their gut bacteria are producing molecule which are killing or showing these antimicrobial property. Just the same way that we are seeing in the soil. So in the soil, these bacteria or fungi and, and so on, they are, um, uh, they are producing molecule which become antibiotics, which is what we use. So maybe it's the gut bacteria of these species which are producing interesting molecule, which are showing the uh, the antibacterial or antiviral or antiparasitic property. So now we're also looking at the gut bacteria of cockroaches as well. So what we do is that we open the gut of cockroaches and we dissect out and we just plate them. Uh, we isolate bacteria from them. And we grow these bacteria in these uh, flasks in culture media or we give them basically food and when uh, they grow in large number then we identify these molecule and then our hope is that perhaps is the gut bacteria which is also effective against uh, showing these novel antimicrobial that we can bring to a to a pharmacy near us okay so what are the uh, opportunities for you? Uh, to me, there are so many opportunities because this area of research has been largely ignored because much of the focus has been on soil bacteria or fungi or focus has been on plants, you know, garlic and ginger. And that's why we put in our spices, right? We put that so that we can kill our, uh, all these um, uh, bugs and pathogens and so on, right? That's why we add the spices and, and cook it to death. But the animal kingdom is something that we ought to respect and we ought to learn from that. So rodents is one, uh, cockroach is another species, and vertebrates and invertebrates from coastal areas are, are other animals to look at. There's so many animals out there that we ought to learn from. There are millions of them. Birds captured, and one of the birds that I'm very interested in is, is crows. And crows are always, you see them near garbage dumping areas um, and... Uh, and other animals, uh, lizards, snakes, frogs, and, and there's so many of them. So I don't want to, to go into detail. And what about the marine environments? You know, when um, the, that has been mostly uh, not really explored very well. 
the marine species, the marine animal animals that we have at our disposal, we ought to look at them as well and isolate both the immune system part as well as the gut bacteria and then identify what do they produce because much of pollution, for example, in Karachi as well that I noticed that much of the pollution can go into the sea. Sometimes it gets treated, sometimes it may not get treated and, and that those animals which are living in those environments, that ecosystem, they will be exposed. So the question is that how do they cope with those heavy metals, those pressures, and then we ought to learn from them then, uh, and then hopefully pull out those, those molecules. And uh, yeah, my apologies again for this slide. So in the end, um, there are many people who, who are part of this research and it's, as you can imagine, it's funded by different agency from the US, UK, uh, Pakistan, UAE, Malaysia and, and different agencies. So we are thankful to them. But most, most importantly, we are thankful to these species who really give their life to, for this kind of research. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, th that that was a very really, really interesting. It, it was like a, you know, to me like a biology class in in the sense that we have a project at Azim Premji University called as I think biology. This this seemed like completely a chapter out of that. Usually in this uh, webinar series, we talk about conserving and protecting the animals. This is the first time, I, and my apologies, everyone. The, we have seen love, you know. Murder and mayhem in the PVTs up till now, yeah. but that that's for a purpose. That that's for a purpose. There's a purpose behind it. So let me just start. There are a couple of questions that I have for you. So you have studying cockroaches for so long. So first thing I want to know: is How did you ever get interested? Are you were you scared yourself when you were a kid, like most of us were? And uh, over the years, have you you have been studying them, but have you started to you know? Uh, feel other emotions like we call love, respect, or these kind of things for the cockroaches? Yeah, a very good question. I, I want to just answer the first part as well, that uh, the conservation is very important to us. And that's why I use the term coexistence. And so ultimately, my hope is that we are not going to dissect these animals. What we're going to do is collect their fecal material, isolate the gut bacteria, and then use that. So we don't have to then go through that process because cockroaches have so many benefits. They can feed on plastics and all kinds of stuff. We can use them for beneficial purpose as well. So, yeah, I'm fully on board in conserving these species. That's very important. Coming back to your, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, it, it's very hard to find <laughs> a researchers or students who are interested in handling cockroaches. There are two species they don't like, one cockroaches and second lizard. And um, uh, But they, these are the most fascinating species. So in the beginning, yes, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, a feeling when you, you, you touch cockroaches. But so I, we encourage students that, look, they're more afraid of you than we are to them. They actually run away when they see us. So they're actually very friendly. Uh, if you, if you uh, once you get to know them, once you start holding them, they, they are harmless. And uh, so they don't cause any damage. They try to run away. And, uh, and then if you're handling appropriate, if you have the appropriate gear, then you will not be exposed to anything they may carry as well. So it takes a bit of time, a few weeks for some of the students to get over their fear. But that's there. That's somehow it's built in our culture as well, not to, you know, so that's something we need to avoid. But students uh, then over the weeks, they get over their fear and then they start to handle these species, be the cockroaches, the snakes and so on. So, so you are saying something that we can get over that fear of cockroaches, is it by handling them and you have seen oh, that yeah. happen? Yeah, absolutely. And in my, many of my students, when they when they join and they see a tub of cockroaches, <laughs> they, they, they panic <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> uh, and uh, when, when to, to go into the tub and collect one cockroach and hold it and so, you know, so we give them slowly, they, uh, they, they get over their fear. So yes, we have seen them uh, all the time and that's the fundamental requirement to work in our lab so that they are able to hold a lizard not by the tail because it loses tail and run away <laughs> hold a lizard and uh, and a cockroach and uh, but students do that yes many students they, they learn that so it depends so some students they're very good at it they uh, especially chinese students they, they don't mind at all uh, but other students from india pakistan bangladesh they take a little bit of time but they, they do get over their fear so i i guess your interviews might seem like those you know, the reality shows of that amazing, you know, 
fear factor or something like that where you have to handle these. Uh... <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, they, they exactly uh, test that. Yeah, absolutely. So, but we, we do it gradually. We don't. We expose them. We mm -hmm. take them to the factory. We show them all the cockroaches. So slowly we, we build their confidence rather than going there and asking them to eat cockroaches. <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> we only work. Yeah. So you you spoke about uh, you spoke about the fact about this and how you know the, the infections are coming in from the animal side and all, and you also spoke about how the animals themselves are you know these insects and all alligators lizards and everyone locust for them for matter are evolving themselves uh, in, in, to take you know to counter these kind of the new uh, viruses and pathogens that are coming in. So I just wanted to understand: uh, Would you say the pace of evolution for these insects like cockroaches has been you know they have been able to beat the cycle while while humans we kind of lag despite being the the uh, prima species of the planet yeah yeah you're right that uh, we we feel that we are the dominant species but when you think about it when you look at the the numbers we, you know we've been here for what for only a few thousand years which is nothing evolutionarily speaking and we have brought this planet on its knees we talk about global warming and you know uh, uh, extinction and, and and all that these kind of measures. So uh, I think other species have done very well in learning mechanism to evolve and adapt and coexist. And what we are doing wrong is that we have this uh, human psyche is that we have to eliminate one species for the benefit of another species. I think that's where we go wrong. We're not learning to coexist. We try to. It's the same thing when we come to mosquito. We want to kill all of them. Uh, and there's a purpose. We, 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 we fail to understand that there's a purpose for every single species. So we have to come out of this and we have to really learn. And, uh, and there's the same thing that you see when we deal with anything, uh, not just learning to coexist, but any matter, be that at the country level or at the world level or the, in anything. So we are very primitive in our thinking that if something is threatening us, we want to kill it. So we ought to understand, we need to communicate with them. It doesn't have to be verbal communication. We have to communicate by other mechanisms through molecules to appreciate what they want to do. So it's, it has to be about coexistence. So other species, they have done very well. We are still very primitive, probably because we may think that we are the dominant species, but we are very new addition. We are maybe the one of the last addition to this planet. So what they have done and what they have seen in our uh, being our ancestor, they have had a very long time to evolve. We are still very primitive, but in the long term, hopefully, we will learn and we will not come up with these mechanisms to kill them, but we will appreciate and we will learn from them and hopefully we will coexist. I hope that answers your questions, Parthi. No, true. So, uh, there's one more thing. Like, there was a talk that we had on the hedgehogs in the past and we spoke about the species of flat and rodents and it just happened that you know the the thing that came out was despite there are so many species of rodent it's just a couple of them that are actually pests to humans now if we if we take the same kind of analogy uh, there are what 4000 or 5000 species of cockroaches how much how many of them would be considered to be pests if we can throw some light of some of the interesting one of those you know uh, cockroaches species that are there yeah, so, so the most uh, abundant species is Americana uh, and sounds like coffee rather than <laughs> cockroach species. <laughs> uh, and so that's the most that what we see in India and Pakistan and many other countries and in Sharjah or in the UAE as well. But you're right that we we simply just classify them as all of them as pests. And that's not true. They actually have very useful purpose. They, they recycle this organic waste. They degrade so much material be the plastic card boxes and, and all kinds of things so they are actually is our classification method in reality they may carry some some uh, problem uh, bacteria and, and microbes and so on but very few and there's only one or two species that are known to to carry any disease if any but it's just a general psyche that we have that they look uh, for some reason we we feel that uh, there's hate against some of these species which is something that we need to remove. But you are absolutely right. There are thousands of species and most of them are living happily and they're contributing to the ecosystem that we live in, which is very, very important. Yeah. And then, as I said, some of the interesting, we, we keep hearing that while there are fear of cockroaches, 
some of some people love to have the madagascar hissing cockroaches as their pets as well so you know yeah absolutely you're right yeah that's one of the most um, uh, common pets in uh, in malaysia and in china uh, so yeah absolutely so yeah the, and then they're quite and they're quite and they're very gentle and when you but the uh, americana one is very fast when you use sprays and insect repellent they run away but uh, uh, other cockroaches they're very slow very calm and people like people play with them so it, it's that kind of feeling i think we need to develop in the the younger generation as well that these species are there for a purpose and we need to learn from them but at the same time we need to have this coexistence with them rather than eliminating them yeah and just for the usa seems to be a melting pot for all these uh, you know cockroaches uh, because if you see a lot of these species are named after places in florida and pennsylvania you know you have these uh, the species are named uh, so why 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 is why is uh, such a uh, america us such a favorite place of all the roaches out there a <laughs> very good question yeah so it's uh, the taxonomy is mostly based on the the interest of uh, some of the scientists and uh, uh, traditionally i think our focus has been on more uh, uh, urgent issues like cancer or cardiovascular problems or those species that we live with or we care about uh, so our focus is not so much on insects so our hope is that we can also learn from them and also appreciate that there is a value to work in these areas as well and we ought to, to to learn from them but you're right that much of the work has been done from the by the uk be that in botany or be that in other species or insects as well in the uk or the us or the european countries so it is time it is high time that countries like uh, india which are you know the uh, there's so many excellent researchers there we also encourage interest in this field as well so hopefully in the coming year we will see more uh, more people working in this area and you have been doing this you have been labeled as a cockroach scientist and everyone talks about you so if you can talk about some of the collaborations that have done and you know how, how do you think the way forward we will be going considering the kind of you know the kind of pressures that our, our species is facing in terms of the evolution of the new pathogens every even we are seeing that constantly happening even in the you know the sars cov virus the way it's constantly uh, you know evolving so do you think uh, research in this domain can really help us in understanding and kind of you know kind of uh, creating a defense mechanism that we can use against these pathogens you are absolutely right so first of all just to answer your first question we work with different agencies so and, and they are very interested in that so at the moment our work is being funded by the us air force and us army they are interested because they feel that you know these kind of species are very hardy so we need to pull out those molecules and, and use them for our benefit uh, regarding your question that uh, how these species are evolving and we ought to learn from them you are absolutely right the, the purpose of every species is to become the dominant on this planet and that has to be the message to the our younger minds as well that uh, every species be that bacteria be that virus be that humans be that birds or whatever they want to be the dominant species and it's about survival they want to increase in number and they want to be the dominant species the trouble with humans is that uh, we don't know when to stop uh, we 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 don't um, we just seems to be growing and growing and that's where the problem lies that then we start affecting other species but other species they seem to reach a saturation point and um, so so yeah if if we can learn from other species then that's the take home message if you can learn from other species that you can learn uh, uh, exist uh, with other species without killing uh, other species so that's what i meant that all these viruses that we see it's not that they these viruses or bacteria and other problems that we're seeing they were not there before uh, things have been here for millions of years and for bacteria billions of years so many of these species have been co-evolving and um, they have been doing very well in co-evolution is so uh, and that's something we the properties that we need to learn from them that what do they use how do they use it how do they defend and then use those mechanisms because to me throwing disinfectants to kill corona is not the answer because you're killing the environment throwing so much chlorine so much bleach in the environment and so much plastic in the environment you're causing more problem so we ought to learn from uh, from other species and hopefully and that have been one of the research that we are doing in the uae as well 
the, we're trying to find out that how do cockroaches survive in the polluted environment and they don't get coronavirus, but we do. And, uh, and how do they survive all these disinfectants that we are throwing in the, in the garbage and then how do they thrive in those environments? So, so I think it's, it's a long-term research uh, and it will take time to come up with answers or identify those molecules, but I think we'll get there, inshallah. Yeah, so you have you have spoken about this. You have spoken that the cockroaches are very uh, smart-brained, and you know, uh, in that sense, uh, they're they're very smart, despite the fact that they have small, small brains. You know, what would their brain size be in comparison to their body if if we were to compare? It? Because we constantly compare us, uh, you know, our brain capacity to yeah, our body size. <laughs> yeah, very good point. Yeah, so their brains, if you look at the ratio of human brain to human body, their brain is are, are, are double the size. So you have to have two human brains to their body mass. So their body mass and the, the, the brain ratio can be considered as double. So that's why they have this bilobe brain. So we have like single brain, we also have bilobe, but you can imagine that their body mass will be double. So but uh, you know but again we're only using very few percent of our brains anyway <laughs> so we are not uh, very effective in that uh, so uh, we're very primitive I, I feel that we're still very primitive in our way of approaching many of the problems that we see that's why we end up creating more problems and solutions but other species that they're, they're, they're good at it yeah finally one one specific question to you before i take there are, there are a couple of user questions that have come and we have we have i have a set of them so i will just before i get into that you know, how many cockroaches have you handled for these research so say a typical research and how do you you know capture them and you know have there ever been a case where they have you know kind of flung and you know there has been a they have <laughs> they got out of their you know cases or yeah, something so yeah, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of cockroaches that because we breed them in our lab. So yeah, so we breed them hundreds of thousands that easily can be bred. So yes, we hand handle in hundreds and thousands of numbers of cockroaches. Uh, so that's uh, number one. And number two, yeah, do they escape? Yeah, sometimes they escape, but they're harmless. Uh, and the cockroaches are the, one of the only species that's actually <coughs> always in the environment which is uh, close to humans so if you're in a hospital you will see them there if you live in a house they'll be there if you live in a hostel they will be there in a university everywhere so they will always be a species that's living closest to humans which suggests that whatever we are exposed to they will also be exposed to the same thing which means that if they know how to evolve and counter the threats that we are facing we can learn from them as well so you know people say that crocodile yes we don't live with crocodile so they may be different, evolutionarily speaking. But cockroaches will be exactly in the same ecosystem, same environment that humans will be. They will always be in the close proximity to humans, suggesting that we are they are facing the same threats as we are. But they are more successful, we are less. So we ought to learn from them. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm just imagining if there's a... Uh, Hollywood, pro, uh, you know, script writer who's listening to this, he would, he would envisage your university and, you know, it starts with all the cockroaches coming out and taking over the world kind of a scenario. <laughs> they won't take over the world. They know when to stop. <laughs> it's yeah. only us. So, yeah, so as I said, we have a couple of uh, very interesting questions which have come up from our students and all, and you know, so we had them, so I'll pose them to you. So, uh, we can go one by one and I'd love to have your take on them. So yeah, the first one was there, you know, the blood of the cockroach is white. I think so you've spoken about it, but I'd like to, what is it exactly when you squish them that uh, white thing comes out? Yeah, so basically when, when you take the blood from cockroaches, you don't kill them. Uh, you kind of, uh, in a way, you just stick a needle. That's the same way that you collect blood from humans. You stick a needle in their abdomen and you can collect blood from them. So you don't have to kill them. So that's the beauty of this, that you don't have to kill cockroaches to collect their blood or uh, for tissues. Yes, you have to do that. But for blood, you don't have to. And same thing for gut bacteria. You don't have to kill them. You can just collect their feces. And then these feces can be then cultured to isolate bacteria. And then you can use them for your research. Yeah. So uh, the another thing that is there, uh, you have constantly spoken about this today you have said that don't kill the cockroaches bring them to i know it will be difficult to cut them to sharjah but uh, uh, there, there's a question who said if you don't kill it it will breed 
and it will bring the house down so how would you you know how how good are they at uh, well, breeding and what taking over the house? yeah yeah, actually, what we have seen is that um, they will not just breed and breed and breed. Actually, they will, you know, they want to be the dominant species. That's understandable. But they're not going to bring any house down at all. They will. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So they know the saturation point. So they have this uh, fine balance as well. In, in all animal kingdom, generally, there's a fine balance as well. So they'll, they'll balance it out. Because remember that wherever there are cockroaches, you will end up getting other species as well. So like, like rodents and so on, which will also control the numbers game as well. Um, but yeah, so not killing, uh, sending the, the, to me to Sharjah, you don't have to. If you like, I can come to your university and research there as well. So hopefully we can build some collaborative link where we can look at some interesting species in, in, in India as well and try to learn from that because, you know, they have very interesting traditional medicine, right? In, in, those, in that part of the world, this uh, older civilization. So we ought to learn from that region as well that what species are there and how they're thriving in that and how we can benefit from that so we ought to maybe have a research center there where we can carry out such research hopefully in the future yeah so there, there's another one interesting what is the typical lifespan of a cockroach and uh, related to that is uh, the cockroaches do they eat each other as well? Is there sort of cannibalism in there? Or something? Uh, cannibalism, uh, very good question, both of them. Uh, so first question is approximately two years. So that's the lifespan of a cockroach. So it depends uh, in, in where do they live. So generally between one to two years. So they have quite a reasonable lifespan. Uh, the, the second uh, question, um, uh, yes, they can. So if there's a cockroach that's not feeling well, sometimes it can be eaten by other cockroaches. But they have these excellent properties to regenerate. You know, when we talk about that, my parents and my grandparents, they have knee pain and hip pain, and, you know, they find it difficult <clears throat> because we're unable to produce collagen. We're unable to regenerate our tissue. But things like with cockroaches, they can lose their hind leg and they can regenerate. Uh, and same thing for lizard. It will lose its tail and it can regenerate. So again, suggesting that they must have these very powerful mechanisms that we ought to learn from them uh, rather than uh, so yeah so uh, uh, approximately two years and um, uh, secondly that um, uh, they can regenerate their their uh, their, uh, their uh, appendages which allow us to use them for other types of research as well yeah. so last two questions i know i'm holding you back there's there's a time time that we are running against so uh, one is you know there's someone asked that are the vampire roaches that kind of fly and you know suck on human blood so, uh, is there a species something like that that, that kind of bite humans as well uh, no no <laughs> there's no such a thing uh, this probably in hollywood movies i mean whoever asked this question <laughs> is watching too much hollywood movies so <laughs> we should uh, cockroaches are harmless uh, they are not after us they're not trying to attack us or anything like that they are more afraid of us than we are to them so uh, same thing for lizard as well they never try to, you know, uh, kill any anything or anybody or cause any damage. So, yeah, we need not worry about that. Yeah. And the last question, and this is something very, I think, so very interesting for you. If there was ever, a, and because we have spoken about a lot of movies up to now, if there was ever a Marvel movie made with a character based on the do you think it will be a hero or a villain? Uh, for my movie, it will be a hero <laughs> because we, we ought to be learning from them. <laughs> but uh, I, I know that uh, we, we are driven by them sometimes by the media as well. And the perception is that they are uh, because uh, wh why is the perception that cockroaches are bad or, or not good? Because they live in waste environment, unhygienic conditions. So naturally, we, we think of them as unhygienic, which means that we want to avoid touching them. That's what's built in us, right? Culturally that because they, that's the kind of environment that they live in. Uh, but overall, to me, the, this is actually makes them more interesting that they're living in such difficult environment, yet they're thriving, which means we ought to respect them more and we ought to learn from them. And that is the message. Yeah. So thank you so much, um, uh, okay. Professor Navid Khan. This one thing you have, you have shared beautiful images of your family and all. I would just, I'm just curious. Are they as comfortable with cockroach as you are possibly? <laughs> they have actually dissected. You know, my kid is uh, six year old and he was dissecting cockroaches <laughs> and he was collecting and handling them and, and also doing the lizards and crocodile, which is uh, 
to me, I was actually surprised because, you know, so in our culture in India and in Pakistan and so on, generally we would prefer not to handle such species. We prefer to stay away from them. But yeah, but my, my kids probably they visit the lab all the time with me at the weekend when we do this kind of research. So they're, they're very comfortable with that. So again, and we, we don't build this fear in them. We don't tell them this is a good species or this is a bad species. To me, all species are beneficial. It's just that we need to learn how to deal with them. It's because we don't know how to deal with them. We classify them as bad species or good species. But in general, in general, all species are good. They have a purpose. We just need to use them more effectively if we are going to evolve with them. So I guess that's the best proof that, you know, we can get over our, you know, we can, uh, you know, come over our fears and kind, kind of live to go this as you've been talking and thank you so much for that message today uh, professor navit and i know you are you are pressed for time and yet you took so much time for us to share your knowledge your you know your research it has been great pleasure talking to you uh it's been an honor and i, I look, look forward i'm sure your talk today will inspire a lot of people to look at you know uh, the best that we call them who live all across us in, in all around us in a little different light and possibly you know we start learning from them rather than just being scared and you know trying to eliminate them. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so, you so much, much for your time. Thank and you. and everyone, all, all our viewers, uh, we'll meet again on Feb 25th where we have another talk as part of our Nature Writing for Children. Thank you so much. See you again. Thank so you. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Bye.